Greetings. Today is the 13th Sunday after Trinity, the 3rd of September of 2023. This service was pre-recorded on Friday the 1st. Participants include Shane Donnelly, reader and video photographer, and myself. Next weekend will be a celebration of the 35th anniversary of the establishment of this congregation on 9-11-1988. And of course, you are invited to a month long of special events marking our 35th year of operation. Go to our website for details. Thank you for joining us. Have a happy Labor Day. During these weeks, we have been looking over the 35 years of Independent Methodist Church. And almost every week for these 35 years, I have had a children's sermon. And what we're going to look at today are a few of the children's sermons that I have given over time. And of course, every children's sermon includes a small gift from the pastor. Some of these you will remember and others maybe were before you were even born. But we had a memorization contest. You were challenged to commit to memory one of the most familiar verses in the Bible, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And the gift that you received were men's handkerchiefs with embroidered John 3.16. Do you remember that? Another gift at Easter time, we traveled around the world, and of course, we ended up in our own country of the United States. And what do we do at Easter time that makes Americans unlike Christians in other places in the world? And of course, on Easter Monday, on the lawn of the White House, our president and the First Lady host the children of America to an Easter egg hunt. And the president, every year, autographs wooden Easter eggs that are hidden, and you can buy them. And here from the year 12 are the Easter eggs from President Obama and his family. And all of you received an Easter egg. Do you have yours? One of the things that I have given that I really, really appreciate, and I think was a, a coloring book on the life of Jesus. And what is unique about this coloring book it takes famous religious art, Christian art from the ages with a Bible verse. And you were given a box of crayons. Do you still have yours? Another gift. For months, months, we had a live 
musical presentation. You were challenged to learn to play a musical instrument. And we had a juice harp. We had bongos. We had a harp. We had handbell, all kinds of instruments. And you were also taught how to play the guitar. And what was your gift? The Beatles, the rock band Beatles and their guitar. And in our travels around the world at Christmas time, a lady in our church, Helen Zaraski, made for all of you a spider web with a spider. And we told the story about the spider that comes from the Ukraine that helped to protect the Holy Family when pursued by the wicked soldiers of King Herod. Last year, you may have found humor when I was talking about Christmas in my childhood and that my older brother, John, he could be bad. And he would go over as a little boy and with his hands, he would smash the glass ornaments. And my grandmother did not like it. And my grandmother, she would butcher the chickens and she would tie the legs on the tree. And my brother was afraid that he would leave the decorations alone. Do you remember that funny story? And of course, I have the adults in the church. They wish that they could come up and they could also receive gifts. And Reverend has given gifts to the entire congregation. For my birthday, we had a British theme. And for the year 12 I acquired from the United Kingdom a special edition of the Bible that was printed for the Queen's Jubilee. You all received one. I hope you still have yours. At Christmas time, we often give out a little ornament, and on the ornament is the name, someone in the church, and you are encouraged to pray for that person. And one year it was a cardboard candy cane, a real candy cane, and even a bell, and it had an attached name. And would you remember this person on Christmas Day in your prayer? We have so many people who work so hard in the church. For Thanksgiving, I gave all of them a little Bible, and this is a real Bible of actual print. And that was a little gift from the pastor, and Ten years ago, when we celebrated the 25th anniversary, all people in attendance received a Christmas ornament from August Wendell Forge of our church. Now, why do I do this? Why, why do I give everybody a gift? Well, did you know there are five ways that humans communicate love? There are five ways. We call it the five love languages. And that everybody has a way, a dominant way that they express love. Now, the way that they want love for themselves might be different. But everybody has a primary way that they show love to other people. Now, some people say it with their words. You know, it's maybe difficult to say, I love you, but other people say it all the time, all right? They, they try to encourage you and build up one another. Other people, they touch. You know, when you're, when you're petting your dog, you're extending love to him, aren't you? All right, so touch, a good touch is a way of showing love. When you're spending time with a friend, hanging out, just being together, you really appreciate being with one another, you're showing love when you're performing a deed of service. You're running an errand. You're cutting the grass. You're shoveling the snow. You're picking up things and helping someone. You're showing love. And there's another way that we show love. It's by giving a material gift, an actual object, a present. Reverend Gilbert's primary way of showing love is giving gifts. I give presents to everybody all the time. I don't wait until Christmas. I'm giving Christmas gifts 12 months out of the year. Now, why do we do this? Well, never forget very important words in the Bible. Words from Jesus. 
And Jesus said, and it's quoted here in the book of Acts. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I get a blessedness in giving to you. And I hope that you have a blessedness in receiving from me. All right, so you have a happy 35th anniversary. And what am I going to give you this week? I told you when I go to the stores, all I see everywhere are Halloween merchandise. And I hope you like Marshmallow Ghost. Have a good weekend. I'm reading from the New International Version Bible, verses from both the Old and New Testaments of God's promises during difficulty. From the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 9, verse 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increased the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. A young man stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 11 through 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And finally, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? This is the word of the Lord. A husband had his face buried reading the morning newspaper at the breakfast table. His wife came over to him and gave her man a kiss. Smiling, she remarked, I bet you don't know what today is. He looked at her and replied, well, of course, I know what day it is. And with that, he went back to the paper. Reality was, he didn't have a clue. Afraid to make the wife upset, for she was sensitive to special occasions, he thought to himself, is it her birthday? That must be it. As soon as he got to work, he called the florist and he had a dozen long stem red roses delivered to his sweetie. As the day went on, he worried that flowers may not be enough for this important day. What if it's our anniversary? So on lunch break, he left the office and he walked to a nearby jewelry shop and picked out a beautiful gold necklace and had it delivered to his one and only. On his way home, this guy, not wanting to be in the doghouse, stopped at a confectionery and purchased an expensive box of chocolates, just in case the missus was put out with him. Pulling into the driveway, the wife ran out to greet him. 
he got out of the car and presented her with a candy. She threw her arms around her hubby and exclaimed, Oh, honey, this is the best Groundhog Day I've ever had. I think you have figured out why the month long of celebration in this congregation, 35 years of God's faithfulness of preserving this pastor and people of God. It may surprise you to hear, but evidence substantiates that between 50 to 80 percent of all new churches fail within the first five years of operation. That's upward to four out of five. What a dismal statistic. Infant churches have a high mortality rate. This banner year needs recognition. By God's grace, Independent Methodist Church has not only survived, it has thrived. And we pray that IMC will have more tomorrows than it has had yesterdays. It is my premise that one of the best churches in Newcastle is not located in Newcastle, and it is our uniqueness which has contributed toward our viability. We are an alternative community of faith, and our presence serves a purpose in the broader scheme of things. Dollar Tree, Dollar General, Family Dollar. Can anyone tell me what is the difference between the three chains? If you have been to one, you have been to them all. Coles, Marshalls, and TJ Maxx remove the sign from their front entrance. Could the customer identify the location? The layout, the fixtures, and the merchandise are variations on the theme. I contend that the same could be said of Church World. Churches tend to imitate each other. Big screens, rock bands, props, special effects, a coffee bar, a hipster preacher with faded jeans and a tattoo delivering self-help advice. Guess what? Independent Methodist Church is not cool, hip, or trendy. During my five decades in ministry, I am doing essentially what I have always done but hopefully with improvement. Every church has both pluses and minuses. No church can be all things to all people. What are our distinctives making us unlike most other communities of faith? Number one, IMC is a depository of tradition, safeguarding the past, for future generations. Tradition is said to be the living faith of the dead, whereas tradition, traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Do we sense the difference? When I process with a baby in my arms at a baptism, the assembly sings, yes, Jesus loves me. This practice is unknown most places. It is an innovation based upon the rite of the Eastern Orthodox baptism. I attach the song. If you watch the funeral of Queen Elizabeth as the royal family walked down the aisle of the abbey, the bells of the steeple were struck 96 times. In 1940, Ernest Hemingway released a novel, For Whom the Bells Toll, one of the biggest hits of the heavy metal band Metallica is For Whom the Bells Toll. The title was from the 1924 poem by the British minister John Donne. For Whom the Bells Toll, they toll for you and for me. The tolling or the knolling of the chimes begins every funeral in this chapel, and the number of strikes is dependent upon the age of the deceased. And the sound reminds all of our own mortality. At most funerals with a committal, I make an earthen cross with a recitation, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The soil is actually 
a mixture of artificial landscape gravel used for a model railroad scene underneath a Christmas tree. The cross is a centuries-old custom from the Middle Ages. There are very few clergy, Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox, employing these rituals. When we have a farewell for the departed, is the service enriched or diminished because of these liturgical embellishments? I want to believe that the funeral is enhanced by the tolling and the dirt cross. Maybe someday the traditions will catch on and enjoy a widespread usage. The road to the future runs through the past. We all know what we know, and none of us knows everything, and right now we know a few things unknown to most of our brothers and sisters in the family of God. IMC is a depository of tradition, safeguarding the past for the future. Number two, IMC is a cathedral of learning. Completed in 1936 with 42 stories, the Cathedral of Learning on the campus of the University of Pittsburgh is the second tallest educational building in the world. Newcastle has a Cathedral of Spiritual Learning. Our fourfold emphasis is study, prayer, hospitality, and the arts. I want to believe that our preaching and teaching are on a college level. Our weekly worship service is available on YouTube. Maybe we should offer our superb Sunday school on Cyberworld. Few church-going adults say that their church or pastor challenged their thinking. If Christians aren't thinking, they're not growing in their faith. The late Vance Havner, one of my favorite communicators of the gospel, saw a striking parallel between the conditions of the nation and the church. As the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights mean little to an increasing number of Americans, so too our primary document, the Bible, means less and less to more and more Christians. Church members are generally as ignorant of Holy Writ as are Americans of the Constitution. A woman in the congregation shared that she was troubled by the high percentage of Generation Z, unable to recognize the preamble to the Constitution. I am disturbed by the younger set incapable of quoting the opening sentence of the Word of God. Gone most places is the midweek Bible study. Sunday school is no longer provided. Bibles are not found in the pews. Members are not encouraged to bring a Bible with them to services. And little public reading of Scripture goes on in worship. And this lack of of attention to the scriptures has contributed to the dumbing down of the church. It is one thing to not know much about our religion, but another to have no desire to grow in it. Our grand teacher inserted in the Shema, the great commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our mind. And the more we learn about God from the disclosure of himself in the book of books, greater will be our love for him. A college professor of religious studies from a nearby school conducted a Sunday school series on the Apostles' Creed. He shared that he had visited most of the churches in the county and that he regarded independent Methodist as among the most biblically literate in the area. Not only was the prof impressed by our knowledge of the people, places, and events of the good book, but by our comprehension of their meaning. Doesn't this appraisal hold value? There are churches which pat themselves on the back 
for their musical talents, and others have derived acclaim for their foreign mission trips. But your pastor takes rightful pride that many of you belong to the FBI, the Fellowship of Bible Investigators. IMC is a cathedral of spiritual learning. Number three, IMC is a concert hall of praise. This congregation has hosted a wide spectrum of sounds and rhythms, classical, country western, Caribbean, Celtic, Mexican jazz, and contemporary. This weekend, we are treated to the harp, violin, and keyboard. Be assured there are very few churches in Lawrence County that would extend the red carpet to traditional hymnody. Humor among preachers goes that when Lucifer, the devil, was kicked out of heaven, he landed in the Quarloff, and that the music department is the war department of the church. And for decades, there has been an ongoing worship war, traditional versus contemporary. Psalm 150 says that we are to praise the Lord with the drums and to praise him with stringed instruments, which would include an electrical guitar. Scripture also says that we are to sing a new song unto the Lord. I get it. Unfortunately, what has evolved in the church of what's happening now, there is a limit of music to rock bands with the lyrics to the current Christian hit parade from North America, its prime source. Across time, the Church of Jesus Christ has acquired a rich treasure chest of music. Be Thou My Vision, both words and music, are 1,300 years old from Ireland. It is unlikely that it would be heard in a contemporary church. Just a closer walk with thee. I want to be a Christian, and we are climbing Jacob's Ladder, our representative of the faith of the black slaves in the Old South. They communicate a heartfelt yearning of an intimacy with the Lord. And of course, this cherished collection is not to be heard in the auditorium of a contemporary worship complex. What is the long-term ramification of pulling the plug on the organ, abolishing the choir, tossing out the hymnal, and minimizing the past repertoire as passé? Church futurist Leonard Sweet in Jesus Drives Me Crazy created an acronym for the word nuts. Never underestimate the spirit. Call me crazy, but I'm still crazy enough to believe that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Call me crazy, but I'm still crazy enough to believe the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Call me crazy, but I still believe that I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Call me crazy, but I still believe that I got joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Call me crazy, but I still believe that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Call me crazy, but I still believe that be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Call me crazy, but I still believe that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, all other ground is sinking sand. IMC is a concert hall of praise. Four, IMC is a service center, a service station. Pulling up onto a lot at a service station, an attendant ran over to one's auto, pumped the gas, cleaned the windshield, checked the oil, and filled the tires with air without expecting a tip. And the motto was, 
service with a smile. Running contrary to the cultural mindset of serve me, this church has been a success because of the vast brigade of volunteers serving in the house of the Lord. It could not be done without their commitment of time, skills, talents, and effort. This army of workers includes ushers, lectors, acolytes, sound technicians, the cleaning crew, <coughs> folders of bulletins, parking lot sweepers, holiday display decorators, funeral dinner cooks, and vacation Bible school teachers. This is not a complete list of the servant of the servants of God. It takes a concerted motivation to serve rather than to be served. A church had four members, everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. I'm sure glad that Independent Methodist Church does not have bodies in its membership, but a continual procession of willing workers giving of themselves wholeheartedly and true-heartedly. Thank you. IMC is a service center. Number five, IMC is a house of prayer. The number one request of both this people and pastor is for prayer, and three-fourths of those appeals are related to physical health. In the past, we have had an open house prayer vigil. Formerly, there was a monthly anointing of the sick service. Discussion has been made for its return. We have a weekly midweek prayer meeting, a bulletin listing of needs, a telephone and email prayer chain, a prayer shawl ministry. There are individuals I call with emergency needs, and we pray together over the telephone. Poet Tennyson Penn the immortal line, more things have been wrought by prayer than what this world dreams of. We won't know the efficacy of our prayers until we get to heaven. Until then, pray on. IMC is not only air-conditioned, it is prayer-conditioned. IMC is a house of prayer. Number six, IMC is a welcome center. The contemporary church in its lobby has a welcome center. Visitors are presented with a welcome package, possibly a coffee mug with the church's name. Back in the 80s and 90s, pie evangelism was utilized nationwide. Pie, personal, invitational evangelism. A newcomer was given an apple pie, maybe with an invite to a home to discuss accepting Christ as Savior and joining the church. I look upon this as love bombing. It would not work with me. Welcome can be phony and should not be viewed as something which transpires when a guest walks through the door. It must first start in the hearts of the membership when they are out and about by their attitudes toward people unlike themselves. For years, there were women who put a caption on the board at the usher station. A long time ago, there was the statement, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if this church is not involved caring for people, then we are not reflecting the heart mind, and spirit of Jesus Christ. When I visit a parishioner in the hospital, I inquire if anyone in the congregation has sent a card. There have been occasions the only cards received came from some of you. 
When I go to a funeral, I check the registration book to see if the signatures include constituents from this body of believers. When I am officiating at a funeral, I scan the audience looking to see if anyone from the flock is in attendance. An emphasis of Methodism is called the corporal works of mercy. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. The church in its wisdom added a seventh. I was dead and you buried me. As Mother Teresa of Calcutta rightly said, just because we cannot feed 100 people, then endeavor to feed just one. And it is within the capability of most of us that perform some small act to positively impact someone in the family of God. IMC is a welcome center. Let us dedicate ourselves to embrace one another. Seven and last, IMC is a launch pad for mission. This is a difficult task, how to get a church to think beyond its walls. The mentality of a healthy church is to turn outward with the ambition of each one reach one. No matter how much a church may want to numerically grow and engage the neighborhoods, It is not going to happen if we don't make it happen. And all around us are lonely, hurting people, caught up with their own problems, and we could point them to Christ. Hal Lindsey of the late great planet Earth made the evaluation, man can live without food for 40 days, about three days without water, and about eight minutes without air but only one second without hope. Hope is spelled hanging on to positive expectations. The positive expectation I seek for all is an experience with a living Lord. A man was part of a guided tour of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The guide pointed out the tombs and monuments of the who's who, in the British Empire, the Whispering Gallery and the Dome by Sir Christopher Wren. The tourist spoke up, this is all well and good, but tell me, has anyone been saved in this church lately? A church exists to bring others into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This is our calling. During World War II, In the north of France, a group of American soldiers became separated from their company due to a blizzard. Making their way to a bombed-out farmhouse, it offered some shelter from the storm. One of the soldiers concerned about the rest of the company who were lost all night long circled the vicinity, calling out into the darkness. Come morning, when the storm was over, the rescuer saw his company coming down the road. Rushing back to the farmhouse, the circle of men huddled together were frozen to death. It was his search for the lost and their safety that kept him alive. Do we get it? IMC will continue to exist if we see ourselves as a launch pad for mission. Everyone is either a missionary or a mission field. An IMC is a launch pad for mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.